के आगे देखेंगे तो ये कुछ आटा कितने देंगे बताओ कितने देंगे आटा आपको नीचे ये चाहिए कि नहीं आटा तो बोला ना आपको पता है कितने का ये दो सौ सात रुपये है पहले महीने ये दो सौ दो सौ चालीस रुपये थे फिर थोड़ा बढ़ गया लेकिन बड़े मार्जिन आपको पता है कितने है? मार्जिन पाँच परसेंट है इसमें बस पाँच परसेंट ही है और ये ये भी यूज करता हूँ कितने साफ है ना सर्फ एक्सेल कैसे देते पता है बिग बास्केट थ्री हंड्रेड एंड फाइव रुपीज के लिए दे रहे हम थ्री हंड्रेड एंड टू रुपीज दे रहे हमारे सेल इतने बढ़ गया लेकिन आपको पता है मार्जिन क्या है इसमें माइनस फाइव परसेंट नेगेटिव मार्जिन है हम एक्चुअली नीचे से बेच रहे हैं ये कैसी बिजनेस है ये पार्ली जी बेसिक पता है मार्जिन इसमें एक रुपये से कम फिफ्टी पैसे मेरे पाके में डालते हैं उसके बाद ये तो बड़ी मुश्किल बिजनेस है ना लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि इट्स ऑलवेज बीन अ प्रीटी डिफिकल्ट बिजनेस इट नॉट रियली न्यू आई एम नॉट आई एम नॉट फ्रॉम इंडिया इफ यू हैव गैस बट आई लिव हियर वो दैट्स नॉट अ बिग डील The amount of Hindi I know should be I should be ashamed of. But the Pandita Sal me kuch to sikhna chahiye. Itni to sikhna chahiye. Um, but I was here before we had uh, <clears throat> before we had real supermarkets. I've been here before we had data on everyone's mobile phone. Um, but a lot of things have changed in the last 15, uh, 20 years in India. But one thing which has absolutely stayed the same is saving money. People love to. And that works for me. And I was very excited during Girl First because I am also someone who loves to save money. So, I mean, you can guess I'm a CTO at a major venture backed company. I probably do okay. This is my car. These jeans have probably been worn 200 times. I only own two pairs. The other ones are ripped. I thought I'd be a little respectful to you guys. I consider a bean bag to be adult furniture. Uh, I love saving money on everything. And I was really excited to join Girl First um, for that reason because Girl First is the Uh, online discount supermarket of of India. You can think of it similar to D-Mart. Uh, what D-Mart is for offline, we are for online. Um, but you know the other reason I was really excited to join Grofers was parties. Not at Grofers. We don't have any parties at Grofers. You can't have parties on one percent margin. What I was really excited about was being able to go to a party and tell somebody to answer that question. That. What is that question that everyone asks you at the party that you hate? Yes, I hate that question. How many of you? How many of you work in software here? Raise your hand if you work in software. Okay, yeah, pretty much everybody. Now, if you go to a party that's full of not nerds, non non nerds, what do you? How do you answer that question? Yeah, I hate the topic. What do you do? Um, Who here is like some kind of agile, coachy, thought leadery, Gyan Wale type person, consultant? You're one of those, no? Okay. So how do you, uh, sir? How do you, how do you des describe yourself when you are asked by random stranger what you do? You make the world a better place. And what do they say? My drink is empty. I'm going over to the. <laughs> Um, so I thought, okay, I'm working. I'm, I can, it's very easy. I'm working for a well-known brand. It's a well-known consumer startup. I just say I lead tech at Grofers, and boom, I'm instantly slotted. Right? I'm instantly judged in whatever way needs to be judged. It turns out that the most common uh, question I get asked is actually not what do you do. It's why is this white guy trying to sell me rice in Hindi? Um, but the second most common question is what do you do, and the answer I commonly get is. Followed quickly by this. <laughs> um, and people love to hate Grofers for a couple of reasons, uh, but let me first show you a little bit. When how many of you here know who Grofers is? Almost everybody. See, this is the kind of party where I would do okay. Um, but when we 
um, when Grofers launched, it launched as a, it wasn't a discount supermarket. It launched as a 90 minutes to give you anything. This is our initial spot that we ran with. <sighs> How was your day? Don't ask. I was Two carton milk juices, eggs, fat-free butter, or strawberries. Malthi body the cleaning mop chaye. Le aaya. Kitchen be stocked hai. Oda dal se dal chini tak. Wow. Ab wo dekho tumhare favorite lilies and chrysanthemums. Ye dekho shea butter wali tumhari cream. And lastly, Bluetooth speakers just for you. You don't always get what you want, which is why we get what you need. Yes, daughter. Growfers. Get everything. From groceries to veggies to cosmetics to tech accessories. Delivered to your doorstep. Growfers. We get it. You like that ad? It's good, right? You know who else liked that ad? Investors. Um, so Growfers launched and quickly raised $10 million, followed by $36 million, followed by $120 million, all within a span of nine months. So our company making about $3 million in revenue. Now that is just stupid. <laughs> that's, a, that's a ridiculous investment. It makes no sense. And pretty soon the market realized that it was quite stupid. Uh, and we basically bottomed out as a company. Um, did a lot of stupid things. I wasn't there. I'm saying we. But we hired a lot of people, moved across the highway to a fancy office next to Google, um, and basically lost our fundamentals. And one of the things um, which happened there is we had to lay off a lot of people. Uh, we had to move back across the highway. We ran out of money. Um, and we had to make a very emergency pivot. So Grow First started off with deliver anything from anywhere to moving to, we'll stock our own things and, and just sell them discount online in a new model which is called EDLP. And this is sort of to show you how the brand changed and how the company changed direction. Happy, happy. My day shopping, done. How did you get this? 120? Then 140. Chevin brush, 250. 250. Put to so. It's a pretty different model, right? We went from this consumer uh, to this consumer. To pretty much, and we said no to a lot of things. We said no to a lot of good ideas, like selling fruits and vegetables, like doing 90 minute express delivery, like selling gourmet. We went from an assortment of 15,000 products to an assortment of 3,000 products and a highly efficient supply chain to, to support them. And it worked. It worked big time. This is our loyal customer account starting in 2017. You can see the, the trajectory on that. We moved from men who forget things to women who plan for things, who try to squeeze out every rupee uh, that they can out of the budget. Um, and this turns out that in India, while you could have a lot of different features, the vast majority of people, there's only one feature that really matters. And what is that? Yes. <laughs> And we've pretty much figured that out, uh, and it's changed our company. Um, but along the way, we went through a bit of a rediscovery of who we were and how we worked. We went from a culture of hubris to a culture of humility. We went from a culture of knowing, thinking we know it all, because we raised so much money, to wondering, to seeing what could be out there. A culture of selling to a culture of serving, and figuring out what our customers really need. All this predicated, really, on the concept of why. Putting why throughout the bloodstream of organization, getting everyone to question all the time why we're doing certain things. I'm going to get more into what I mean there, but to start with, I just want to understand why this is so important that we question things. The reason is we are not special. Um, sorry, Nadesh, just some water. Thanks. Um, we're not. Thanks. We're not. Uh, we have no intellectual property. We don't have any secret sauce. We don't have any uncle in government. Our margins are razor thin. The only way that we can really get ahead is by having the ignorance to go out there and say we don't know, find out, and then the courage to execute it faster than our competition. That's really all we got. There's nothing else. We're just selling the same Saman that anyone can sell. 
We're just trying to find a way to do it more efficiently and give our customers ways to save on their needs so that they can spend on their wants. And this ultimately is just what we call innovation, our ability to learn the truth and then execute on it. Um, and so now we've had this really good run, and this is where my sort of story starts today and the crisis that we've run into in the last couple of years. What happens as an organization grows to innovation? Let me put it this way. How many people here work for an organization which has more than 500 people? Raise your hand. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, keep them up, please, if you don't mind. All right, and how many of you worked there when it was less than 100? Excellent, okay. Huh? I see, how many of you worked for that same organization when it was less than 100 people? Okay, and if you don't mind, you're like only one of a couple here. Why, why would you, what would you say is the big difference? You gotta speak up, you're not mic'd. Yeah, when, you, when the company was under 100 and when it's over 500. Okay, complete chaos ensues when you have a large group. And what happens when you have chaos? What's that? You try to bring order. Who tries to bring order? The management, the boss, right? Um, you know, you end up with a sort of a hippo culture oftentimes when you, when you grow. You don't mean to become that way, but things get out of control, and then the big boss steps in and says, we gotta do this, otherwise it's not gonna happen, right? And that works sometimes. Not to badmouth that, there's a, there's a time when that's appropriate. Um, but it can't be the only thing that you go on. Why can't it be the only thing that you go on? Why is it not a good idea to trust the big boss all the time? Because they're wrong a lot. And when an organization gets large, what is the chance of a, does the chance of a big boss being right go up or go down? It goes down. Why? He's not close to he or she are not close to the front lines anymore. They don't know what's really going on in the front lines. Um, and so, the point I'm going to make to you today, and the thing we're going to talk about, the journey at Growfers, is an innovative organization, one that innovates at all the edges, is an effective community, an effective community of people with purpose. It's people who can are effective, can get the job done and who care about what the job is and understand why they're doing it. And that's a culture, that's a community of innovation that exists, as opposed to an organization which executes projects. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a little bit of storytelling. Um, and we're gonna start with, I'm gonna talk about sort of effectiveness and how we brought about effectiveness within the tech organization at Growfers. Um, this guy, uh, his name is Vedek Kapoor. Um, I've known him since, since he was in college. Really sharp young man, I really liked him a lot. Uh, so sharp, I've tried to hire him three times. He's turned me down three times, which shows just how smart he is. Uh, and the last time, he reverse poached me, because I came to him, he was leading uh, most of engineering at Grofers, and he hired me to come in and, and sort of be the gray hair and you know, counsel the organization. So I started doing a couple days a week with them. The first thing we noticed uh, about the organization is that they released every two or three months, um, which, Basically, for all of you Agile coaches, I'll skip through this part quickly. There's clear problems with that, right? Uh, we don't know uh, what's going to come. It's not transparent. We're, doing, we're dealing with specs. People don't have meaning in terms of what they're doing. Uh, there's no retrospection. We're not getting these to customers soon. So there'd be a lot of uh, missed buses, a lot of people pretty unhappy within the organization because of that. Um, so me coming in, I was like, okay, this is easy. These are all kids, and uh, I'm the gray here, and I, I know what to do here, and I stepped in and I implemented a certain framework that's pretty popular. Starts with an S, right, okay. Let's see, when I asked, when I asked Naresh, he said, can you come to this talk? And I said, yeah, what do you want me to talk about? He's like, your conference, you know? And he said, well, just, just tell everybody, you know. <laughs> so I had to put this slide here. Um, but we totally do scrum now. So uh, this was, and this was sort of the first step of becoming effective. Um, so after we implemented Scrum, you know, we started having uh, you know, sprint reviews, we started having uh, user stories, uh, we started being, you know, we started releasing a lot faster, we started retrospecting. Um, we didn't release a lot faster, sorry, we iterated a lot faster. We still didn't release very fast. We would have a sprint, we'd plan the workout, we'd get some of it done, but it wouldn't really get to a release phase. We would just sort of count 
story points and put them in a bucket and move them from one bucket to the next bucket. But it wasn't that we were actually releasing software any faster. It would still take probably a month or two for most things to get out the door. So this wasn't really it. And why was that? It's because our teams were basically structured like this. We had different, different teams. Um, and I can tell you, I'll give you an example of, of how, bad, how bad it was. When I started uh, working with one team that I was talking to, oh, this got a little cut off. Um, basically, there's a senior engineer and a product manager, and they each had different to-do lists. The product manager uses Trello. They're in one scrum team. The senior engineer uses a text file in Git, um, and they didn't even know that the other person's to-do list existed. <laughs> That's how, uh, how discombobulated the team was. Um, and so, of course, what ends up happening when you have this type of situation is that we did a lot of uh, we did a lot of handoffs. When we have a lot of handoffs. You have this thing called skill-based prioritization. Are you guys familiar with what I mean? What do I mean by that? What's that? Do what you can. Yes, which basically meant yes. So we had a team, and there's one Android engineer, and the, the main goal is to redesign the home page. We're like, oh, we can't take that on because there's only one engineer here. So we need to like, do more backend stories and that kind of thing would kind of come up. Uh, we had poor quality. Um, why did we have poor quality with, with, with functional teams? Because everything got passed. One team would complete their, their piece of the work, but then they'd pass it to the next team. Um, and it would never really be done done. And so we didn't really have a concept of, of fully done done within the team. Um, pretty basic stuff again. Let's skip through it pretty quickly. Uh, so a couple things we did. Obviously, we made cross-functional teams. We merged in uh, all the skills together in one group. Um, and why is this important for innovation? Because if people cannot actually attack the problem, if they can't get from an idea to something that works, then they're never really going to feel like they can change the system. You see what I mean? If they feel like I do my piece, and then I have to hand it off to somebody else, who hands it off to somebody else, their work is so far removed from the eventual result that they don't feel like they can really change anything, and then they don't think outside of the way things are done. So it's really crucially important that we build teams that are able to get something to production quickly. Um, and we focused a lot of time on that. Uh, the all-team test is kind of an interesting hack. How many of you work in software organizations um, who have little to no automated testing? Let's be honest. Um, and so that means that you have, how do you release then? Slowly, yeah. Yeah. So what we did, and how many of you, your manual testing, who does it? Testers. So the first thing I did, which made me extremely unpopular within the organization, is I said there's no such thing as a tester. We're going to document all the test cases, and once every two weeks, we're all going to sit down for two hours, and we're going to run through all of them. There's no CAS system here of like, I'm a tester, I'm a developer, that's done. You're responsible for your quality. Everyone introducing that pain of manual testing to the entire team is what drove everyone to actually invest in automation. Before that, it's just somebody else's problem to clean up, and you'll never actually get there. So that was another big uh, sort of coup that got us releasing every two weeks, and not just releasing um, a piece of it, but releasing the whole functionality. And so then we also start having sprint reviews. And the sprint reviews, this is not actually a sprint review. This is the best picture I could find. <laughs> Our sprint reviews are actually about 60 people and multiple teams in different places and stakeholders moving around between them. Um, and it was, it was really effective. For the first time, tech was not this pariah. It was like, I throw things over the fence and I don't know if I'm getting back. Now it was like fully transparent. And every sprint, there's a release going out. I know exactly what it is. And people are having conversations about what's next. And different teams are cross-collaborating with each other. And it felt so good, and I felt so proud. I went to the CEO, and I said, what do you think? You know, it's been three months. Uh, I've been working part time here. And, and Albie, the CEO, he says to me, it's great the tech is so transparent now, and we're getting a lot done, but I don't know why the fuck we're building any of the stuff we're building. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that kid, yeah, anyway. Um, so this is basically what he, what he said to me. OK. Um, Okay, fine then. And this becomes the second part of building a, a culture of purpose, is impact. If I'm just getting things done, 
but they don't matter, then I'm not getting anything done. And so we need to figure that out. So I started working more with the product organization. Um, and this is the, the problem that we had here was we had what we called output-driven teams. So we had done away with the back end, front end, that kind of stuff. And now we had teams like shopping cart, landing pages, payments, search. These are reasonable. You can control that part of it. You can keep releasing in that space. But there's some problems with this. It leads to micro-optimization. So I have a payments team. All they do is work with payment providers. What if I have enough payment providers? What if I don't need any more? But they have to keep doing that because that's their job. Um, and then, you know, how do they actually map the rest of the business? How are they effective? This is just getting something done, building features. It's not actually necessarily producing any value. And so we, we looked at, um, right, I'm sorry, just give me a second to collect my thoughts. Right, the other thing this really led to was incremental change. So because this team said, I'm focusing on the, cust on the shopping experience, the only thing I can focus on is, are people adding more products to their cart? They didn't think about if those were the right products. They didn't think about if the margin was good on those products. They didn't think about the entire business at all. And they just focused on releasing features. And they said, we're doing a good job. We're meeting our every sprint. We're getting the story points done. And this came our, our sort of brainwave that we need to move to what we call outcome-centric teams, um, away from output-centric teams. Now, what is an outcome-centric team? Can anyone give me an example of what you would call an outcome-centric team in e-commerce? What would be an outcome of an e-commerce centric tech team? What's that? Sales, sure, that's a bit broad, but yeah. Yeah, retention, right. So we moved to retention, acquisition, conversion, personalization. These are teams that could move anywhere they wanted in the code base, and they were, there was real business targets that they were trying to hit. Um, and this really helped a lot, because now it looked like tech was contributing. Tech wasn't just this, like, painful like cousin you had to deal with to get something done, tech was actually contributing to the business. Tech felt like a first party player in the whole thing. We were looking at the same goals as the rest of the business. And this is about the time that Aldi uh, asked me to join as a CTO and take over and merge product and engineering together and sort of start having all the teams thinking about how they contributed to the overall business. Um, and this was a huge change for us, huge change. Uh, it really changed the entire culture of the organization and the way that we talked about work in, in engineering. Um, and it made us really successful. I mean, we were killing it. We were like, we were releasing stuff every sprint. We were using data to validate our releases. Uh, every sprint review had data, had hypothesis. We had like, we were really uh, focused on what we needed to do and the results were, were showing. But then something really bad happened. Um, This is our attrition in the Gorgon Tech office. And it's a bit hard to read my shitty graph, but you can see that it sort of spikes a couple times, once in Feb and once again in, <clears throat> in June. It goes way up. That while we're getting so much more done for the business, people aren't happy and people were leaving. Good people, some of them really good. Um, and while that, these, aren't, these numbers aren't, uh, they got cut off again, I think there's something wrong. Oh, they, they're only cut off here. So while these numbers are not actually gaudy by industry standards, because in the attrition at startups in India are, is actually generally quite high, for me it really made me call into question a lot of the ideas that I had, a lot of the things that I was trying to push. Um, and we had to think about why this was happening. And one thing you should know about Grofers is this is our cafe, okay? This is what we call a meeting room. Uh, nobody stays at Grofers for the table tennis. There is nothing nice about the place. The office is very bare bones. And so if someone is there, it means that they actually give a shit about their job. They actually care about what they're doing. They actually like their manager. They actually believe in something. So if people are leaving, we know why. We know that something really wrong with what we're doing. We pay okay, so it's not a money thing. But there's something really wrong that people are feeling. And so we, I did an offsite with um, our technical leadership team at this really nice place uh, in Manesar, and we sort of talked about why is this happening? What is this crisis? And what we came to is we have a mushroom problem. You guys know what the mushroom problem is? No? Okay. Mushroom problem is they keep me in the dark and feed me shit, which is 
basically people felt, they said, hey, like, I'm, I'm now very effective, I'm now getting results, but I'm getting them for somebody else, and I don't even know really why. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not contributing to the strategy. I don't know how, I don't know what part I play in the overall strategy, and I also don't know how I can influence the overall strategy. And that's a crisis of, pur of, of purpose, that we're highly effective, we're highly efficient, but we're not really feeling it. We don't know why we're here. We don't have that sense of it. And when you have that, people don't innovate. People do what's required of them. Yes, the roadmap is well-structured. The roadmap is outcome-based. The hypothesis are data-driven. But nobody cares. They just get their job done and leave. And after a while, they get their job done even less and less. And they certainly don't challenge the status quo, and they certainly don't think outside the boundaries of what their goal is, and they certainly don't contribute to the ideation of what their team should be working on. Um, and so for this, I don't know if you heard Nadesh talking earlier. He basically said a lot of the, the same things. Um, oh, I didn't give the cookies out. So we can use them. <laughs> it's okay. Um, we implemented uh, objectives and key results. How many of you use OKRs? Yeah, a few. How do you feel about it so far? Anyone feel negatively about it? You can say that, it's safe. Gropers tried and failed twice to implement OKRs. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I brought you some Gropers cookies, don't worry, they're not rejects or anything. They're like, they're full of stuff. <laughs> um, and so what this meant was, for us was, when people define OKRs, it's basically saying this. I agree to this goal. I agree to be judged based on this goal, and I know how this goal is valuable to a larger organization. And once we had codified that and put it in place, and people knew exactly where they fit into the whole thing, and we spent time making sure that every engineer, every intern understood what the overall company strategy was and how their piece of it lined up, then magic started to happen. It completely changed the way we operated. It completely changed the culture of the place. You can see our attrition graph has basically gone to zero um, since we implemented OKRs across the tech organization. Um, and it got people talking about different things. People didn't complain about code reviews. They didn't complain about JIRA. They didn't complain, none of this shit. They didn't complain about Scrum. They abandoned Scrum when they needed to. Uh, they just cared about results. They just cared about what they could do to create the results. Uh, and, and I stopped worrying as a manager about people following rules because I just knew that they knew where they were supposed to go. I didn't need to make rules anymore, which is awesome if you're a manager, right? Uh, so it really worked out well for everybody. Um, and every quarter, we have a, a meeting where we basically get together, this is about half the team um, at one of these ones, the other half are busy on something which I'll talk about in a minute, where we have a day of why. We basically spend the whole day talking about why we're doing what we're doing, setting our goals, letting each other know our goals, et cetera. And because of this, we have like we have much much better employee engagement. All right, um, but there's one more villain, um, and the villain is that once you get out of tech and you have tech functioning in this kind of way, the whole rest of the organization needs to function in the same way. Because if you have your goals but they're not aligned to the goals of other teams, then what happens? What's that? You have a clash, you fight. Also, you can't, um, what can tech really do on its own? Uh, like, let's say a lot of companies, some companies you can do amazing things on its own, but at an e-commerce company, what can tech really do by itself? Not a hell of a lot. If we implement a new algorithm for picking in a warehouse, there has to be someone on the ground from the operations team who trains everyone to use this new device, use this new app and bought into it. If we, if we create a new feature for sharing deals with your friends, someone in marketing has to promote that deal for it to actually take, take impact, right? If we go up with a new algorithm to improve our pricing, someone in the category team needs to work with the brands uh, to, get, to get certain deals that align with that new algorithm. So everyone's connected system. And so only really small micro improvements can be done by one team. <clears throat> Anything really disruptive, and remember, nothing special about us. And we're underfunded versus big basket. So we need everything to be special. It needs to be really big. It needs to involve everybody. Um, so we started working, trying to work on this problem. Uh, I started, I moved out of tech. 
I'm still in, I'm still the CTO, but my role has much more become the OKR guru, <laughs> OKR wallet at, at Grofers, and trying to get all the teams to adopt uh, adopt this framework. Um, but more interesting, here's a, here's a, a story of a team we built, you know, really crappy selfie. Uh, this is called the Project Basin team. This is an example we ran. This is starting in in December uh, of the kind of teams we want to build. So we came up with this idea that we thought maybe if people bought in communities, they would be more likely to retain. Um, so how many of you how many of you have family in a village? Are you all total urban dwellers? Okay, a few people. Good. Okay. So when people go to the village, what's a common thing they do when it comes to shopping? Or like, what do you ask them to get? What's that? Something that's local over there, right? And do you have to get a little bit of or a lot of it? A lot of it. And if you have other family members live in the city, you all pull together, right? And somebody comes back with a giant. This is a common, there's an existing uh, buying pattern in India. We want to replicate online. So we said we'll set up society groups. So within one society, you guys all get some special rewards if you all shop the certain amount of grofers. Or the top chopper in a society gets this. Or that kind of thing. We tried to run a program on this. It's a new idea. We thought it might lead to greater retention, greater frequency. Um, then we established a different kind of team. So you can see there's someone from product, marketing, user research, UI, UX, data. There's a couple engineers who are probably too busy coding to get to go out drinking. Um, and these guys hit the ground running with this project. Uh, they launched a landing page in about a day and a half in a Jugar sort of way. They just got it up there. They started talking to users. They went to societies, did focus groups. They came back the next day. They put up whiteboards in community centers. They run gold cup stands. They did whatever it took to iterate. Every day iterating, changing something, learning something, changing something, learning something. But more importantly, they had all the tools at their disposal. They had every discipline. They had access to every system. They had permission. They had like executive buy-in, but they also had the skills and the access of the entire organization to solve this problem. That's heaven. And it wasn't that complicated, actually. And in three weeks, they instituted this pilot, and they showed a 10% uplift in frequency and a 7% up, uh, uplift in ordering order value. So now we're scaling it out in India. Um, I think this is how we want all of our projects uh, basically to run from now on. It's extending the scrum to anyone and everyone who's relevant to that job to be done, and it doesn't reside within the engineering organization. It resides across the entire organization. It's a community of purpose that exists there to solve something. Now I'll share another quick story. Um, how many of you guys heard about this? The Grand, old ba grand Orange Bag Day sale? Anyone, anyone saw our marketing? A few people. Not too many. Wow. That's, that's shocking. Okay. We spent a lot of money. Not so much in Bangalore. Um, we ran a huge sale. We came up with the idea at the end of December. December 27th. We said, let's run a huge sale on Republic Day. We said, okay. A week later, we had a sign-up page out. Two weeks later, we had plastered all of India with our marketing. We did boats, trains. We put a 30-foot um, you know, bag up in Cyber City. Uh, we expected that we'd hit around 60 crores in sales during this 10-day uh, period that we ran the sale. Um, and so one of the things we did with the team is we, got, we basically got everyone in the company involved. And this is some of the, we ran a little contest for people to come up with their own ways to talk about the sale. So India ki biggest grocery sale ka award jata hai Grand Orange Bag Days ko. Sachi, Muchi, ab hi chalte, chaliye. Puri team ready or not? Yes. India ki biggest grocery sale. That is great. Sign up, sign up. Hazrat, Hazrat, Hazrat. Do a gaya hai yaro Grand Orange Bag Day. So we ran this and submissions started pouring in from all over the enterprise. I mean, Grofers is pretty large. We have uh, 2,000 on roll, but about 20, 000, probably 10,000 off roll employees at any given point in time, sort of warehouse workers, etc. cetera, uh, sending in their ideas. People started holding different competitions uh, and how they could promote it. We started having the warehouse workers were getting compensated to go out and spread the word. We've, we've had delivery boys to go talk about it, et cetera. Um, and people had a lot of fun because everyone was doing the same thing. And everyone had the same goal in mind. Uh, and then after about, we had a goal of about 60 crores, and after four days into our 10-day sale, uh, 
this app. Yeah, I think uh, we can probably get that. <laughs> not just a bunch of people who have jobs and titles. And us as leaders, our job is to continually find ways that we can inject more why into people's lives. Systems which do not seek to control, but seek to inspire. And I think I've sort of gone on long enough, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here. But I do want to <clears throat> quickly just talk about someone who had this idea uh, long before me, who's guided a lot of the work that I've done at Growfers and continue to do, um, which is uh, David Hussman. So David passed away this, uh, this year uh, in the summer. He's not someone I knew very well. We've communicated you know, maybe a dozen times. But uh, he was a, a real thought leader in the Agile community. Um, and I think you would hate to be called a thought leader, so I probably shouldn't say that word. Um, but you know, he was someone who thought deeply about people and the way they worked. I think he called himself a software anthropologist. Um, and David came up with something called uh, dude's Law. How many of you have heard this before? Anyone? Okay, good. A few of you. Of anything that I've read about the field that we're in, this is the one which I can always go back to and say that, okay, if I have to make a decision, I just run it through Dude's Law. Um, essentially, is value is why over how. But the more how, the more process, the more rules you add to a system, the less value comes out of it. The more purpose, the more inspiration, the more retrospection you add to a system, uh, the more value comes out of it. So I, uh, I'm going to leave you all with, with this, and uh, much smarter, much smarter dude than I. And I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you didn't like the biscuits. Before anyone asks, you can take whatever you'd like. Thank you. So I'd like to start. Me dead or not, it's okay. yeah, I'd like to start by saying that uh, your Hindi was amazing. I think everybody was surprised. Uh, but uh, not more of a question, but more of a uh, suggestion or an observation. Uh, you mentioned about how uh, Big Basket is a competitor for you. And uh, Big, Big Basket, when, when consumers hear about Big Basket, they kind of tie it with uh, Shah Rukh Khan, right? Yeah. So I was just wondering if uh, Grofers has approached Amir Khan. He would be uh, more than glad to freely uh, uh, sponsor Who? you uh, if he sees that, yes, it can be a good competition Who? with... Who uh, is this? Who? Amir Khan. Amir Khan. Nay, but I was thinking, you know that movie, The Fan? Or something, there was that movie about the guy, the impersonator, Shah Rukh Khan impersonator. Uh, uh, I was thinking we'd get him, because no? we're like... <laughs> Bilkul Sasta basics, like, you know, like <laughs> The marketing guys won't let me, though. There's a good reason why I don't run marketing. Hi, I, I have a question. Um, while you set up OKRs, how, while you set up OKRs from the management team, and, uh, I mean, and you want the uh, people to drive it in a proper way, what's, the, what's your formula or what, what's uh, your perspective, how it ideally be driven because a lot of the companies are now uh, setting up OKRs but they're still doing it in the same way how they used to do it before setting up OKRs. So when you say how they should be driven, do you mean how they should, like the governance of it or do you mean the mentality no, uh, shift? The execution of OKRs. So when you set those objectives and you tie it up with the key results, mm -hmm. so then how to inspire people to follow the pattern of, I mean the objective of setting up OKRs rather than just setting up OKR for the name yeah, that's a good question. So I think growers have tried to set OKRs before and failed. We also failed. Like, this is a presentation, so I'm supposed to say that we've done something smart. Like, we've failed plenty. We mostly failed. Um, I think the first quarter we failed. Um, OK, the first quarter, one thing we succeeded in is that we started very small. So I just started with um, basically the, the, the six leaders who, like, tech and growers is about 140 people now. Um, so we just started with like, the six of us from the core team to define like some overall, what we call business OKRs, as well as excellence OKRs. 
One thing I don't want to lose sight of is working on things which make us better as a team. For instance, we have excellent OKRs around this quarter, around like canary releases, releasing an alpha build to our internal team, moving to um, you know like uh, Kubernetes and moving to being able to spin up staging environments quickly, so that we can you know iterate more quickly across different different teams, just testing out features. Those are not for the business, but we should keep those. So we sort of separate the two, and we have business OKRs different. We define them centrally, and then we brought in a, a smaller group of leaders to take on the next level of sort of figuring out how they can contribute. We didn't involve the whole team. The next quarter, we got more inclusive. We sort of defined a, a sketchy top level two weeks before the quarter started. Then we had teams break up and sort of work on how they contribute. So I think that's one, one thing is to start smaller, to get more buy-in before you try to run, run something larger. That's important. The other one is, is just education. Like I made everyone in the executive team uh, read Measure What Matters, uh, which they all resisted a lot, but then they finally did it, and everyone came back together and was like, holy shit, yes, we should do this. So I think just basic education. People take the term, watch a YouTube video, think they got it, and then like even Measure What Matters isn't really an instruction manual. It helps. But I think reading lots of resources. Felipe Castro is really helpful. His stuff's good. So I hope that's helpful. And just I think you have to commit. OKRs is not magic sauce. It's, it's the same thing. I mean, I've been working long enough, 20-year career now. I've done MDOs and KPIs and all of the balanced scorecard. I've done all that stuff. It's not really much different. It's just a system, and it's a system that works. But I do think with any system, you have to commit to it. You can't say that, OK, this quarter we didn't meet them, or this quarter we weren't good at tracking. You have to kind of commit for some time to improve what it means to your organization. a cocktail party or what? Everyone wants to talk about Big Basket. <laughs> so my question was, how much did you care for your competition versus uh, how much did you care for uh, finding out your, you know, balance of your team? Or, uh, because initially you mentioned that you could not find your why, and then you uh, changed your focus to the value of your team. Yeah, good question. I think big, I mean, what happened was Grofers launched Express. That disrupted the market. Big Basket came and started doing Express. Right. And then Grofers uh, started doing daily, Big Basket started doing daily. Um, there was a lot of that that kept happening. Um, how do I put this? Uh, we, don't, we don't really worry about it too much. The reason the competition is, is actually relevant, our biggest competition is actually uh, Cardano Shop and DMARC, right? And, and like Big Bazaar. It's not actually Big Basket at all. Um, both from a demographic perspective and also just purely from nature of the market. Like, it's a very huge market, $600 billion market, of which you know, online grocery is like one, less than one billion, about a billion, right? So most people go offline. The, the reason competition is important is uh, mainly from a fundraise perspective, uh, to be frank. Like you have to be showing traction that you're going to be able to hit economies of scale and make your business profitable at some point in the future, which requires that you have to sort of be gaining market share. But I think one of the things we intentionally did as a company and took a very hard stance on is we're not going to try to do everything. So we're a big, big basket has 20,000 products, and it's probably good for people in this room. Probably a better thing. I think you should probably use big basket, everyone in this room, probably. Um, we only keep 3,000 because it allows us to have deeper vendor relationships, which get better prices. It allows us to have a more efficient supply chain. We don't deliver in 90 minutes. We deliver in two days because it allows us to have greater density in our delivery routes, which then correlates to less cost for the customer. So it's a different orientation of the way we, we sort of think about the business. I think it's becoming less and less of a competitive relationship as we move more towards Bharat and they pretty much stay in India. Yeah. Last question. The team's gotten kind of big, so it's a bit hard to kind of get everyone clued in. Um, and I think what I found is that you, it's a combination of, um, what's the word? Um, divergence and convergence. So earlier on, there's some company level priority set, there's some tech excellence level priority set. Then we go into teams, diverge. Teams propose what they're gonna do for those. There's some convergence, some editing, diverge again. It just helps to tie it all together in one day where we spend an entire day um, going through last quarter's OKRs, quickly grading them, quickly talking about what went well, what didn't go well. 
I bring in all of the execs uh, who are relevant to the quarter company priorities. I have them sit with the tech team and not address them, not do this. Uh, I have the tech team prepare questions and then I moderate a panel, which can go on for a long time and difficult questions get asked and people get challenged, the CEO gets challenged by a junior engineer and whatever about the, the company strategy. Um, I think that's really effective. And then we do, we actually do this silly gimmicky thing, but it's like we do the cocktail party. So you get basically uh, get a list of five people who are in tech somewhere. It could be designers, could be user researchers, could be product managers, could be DevOps engineers. And you have to go find them and basically you have five minutes to tell each other about your OKRs for the quarter and then switch and then do this. And that creates a good cross-pollination of what's happening. And that means that you know, sometime down the way when someone needs someone's help, everyone's aware of the overall context. So it helps them make better decisions and better sort of trade-offs throughout the quarter, I find, rather than everyone being in their own silo you know, about what's going on. And then we all get really drunk. And that's a good thing too. Okay, sounds good. All right, thanks, all right. Jacob. Thank you, everyone. He's gonna be around if you guys need more questions. <laughs>